Good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome again to the Institute for Global Health Sciences COVID series. Today, we have a great speaker with a great topic. Dr. Monica Gandhi is uh, again a speaker with us. As uh, you might remember, um, Dr. Gandhi is a professor of medicine at UCSF. She got her Harvard MD at Harvard and MPH at Berkeley. She did her internal medicine residency at UCSF. And she's currently the director of uh, CIFAR, as well as the medical director of the HIV clinic at the San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, the topic uh, for today is uh, masking in COVID-19, transmission, severity of illness, and immunity. I can only say that uh, Dr. Gandhi has been the champion of masking with strong evidence behind. So we will get an update from Dr. Gandhi and uh, we're very grateful, Monica, to have you again. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm just gonna share my slides here. And we will begin. Okay, can you all see those slides? Hopefully these are visible to you all. Okay, so we are gonna talk about masking in COVID-19 and talk about some elements of transmission, severity of disease, and immunity. Um, and the outline of this talk is we'll go over the first two reasons for facial masking, which I think is to reduce transmission to yourself and to others. Um, and then we'll talk about a hypothesis that's developing around this question of um, reducing the severity of illness if you're either socially distanced or masked, the so-called viral inoculum theory. We'll go over the virologic, epidemiologic, ecologic evidence for that, and also talk a little bit about mechanism. We'll talk about whether facial masking could drive up rates of immunity and then I wanna go over some six possible reasons why the mortality of COVID-19 seems to be decreasing with the second wave versus the first wave of infection in the United States and Europe. So in terms of messaging and when this even first came about, it was on April 3rd when the CDC recommended cloth face coverings due to the frequency of asymptomatic transmission. What happened on that day? Well, we couldn't believe that this was spreading so fast. It was not spreading at all like its cousin SARS, um, which had 8,098 cases in 2002, 2003, and then it was over. Um, and now we're at 43 million cases and counting. What was causing this degree of spread? And really what it was is that even when you feel well and you're asymptomatic, you can shed at high rates from your nose and mouth. That data came out in late February, early March, and it really led to this idea that asymptomatic transmission is um, really spreading, uh, leading to a lot of this transmission with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so the message from the CDC was, well, wear a mask to protect others. Now, um, we believe uh, that there's ample evidence um, that's accumulating and from other respiratory viruses and so forth that there's a reason to think that masks protect you as well. And so California and San Francisco have both updated their public health messaging to say wear a mask to protect you and others. Um, this hasn't changed at the CDC. And I do wanna go over some of that evidence, but when I, before I do, I wanna tell you that if you put in COVID-19 and masks in the um, PubMed, you will see a thousand or more studies. And that's because there's a lot of physical sciences and engineers that have gotten in the mix um, with max masking. And some of those studies can be very confusing. What does it mean when you have a mannequin and you have a mask on them and you spray something into the mannequin's face? I, I think it can be very conflicting. And so I wanna really focus on the epidemiologic studies um, that are showing us the effectiveness of masking. We will get back to the physical sciences a little bit near the end though. 
So what are some of these studies? Well, um, the, the, in JAMA, there was a study that was published um, on July 14th among healthcare workers in Boston healthcare system, because what happened is Atul Gawanda published a piece in the New Yorker about how all the healthcare workers stopped getting infected in Hong Kong once we universally masked in healthcare centers. And suddenly all the hospitals understandably around this country adopted universal masking. We mask for every interaction. This was not something that was ever done before. And, um, and you can see that this pink line, the area in the pink shows healthcare workers in the Boston healthcare system getting SARS-CoV-2. The institution of masking occurred on March 25th. And then you can see the decrease um, with SARS-CoV-2 positivity among healthcare workers in the setting of universal masking. This uh, study up on the right uh, top um, got a lot of attention from the CDC, MMWR. These were two hairstylists in Missouri who both had COVID-19. They uh, were both masked. They exposed 139 clients who were also masked and none of those clients became sick. Now they didn't actually test all the clients, only 67 of the 139 agreed to testing. All 67 were negative. Maybe the other 139 got up already symptomatic. We'll talk about that later, but certainly no one got sick. And then um, on the bottom right is the MMWR study published recently on October 9th from the CDC that showed what happened in Arizona with all the surges and the hospitalizations over the summer. Very strict mask mandates were put into play, as well as limiting large gatherings, closing bars and restaurants. So we don't know the effects of each of these, but the transmission went from surging at 151% to down 75% with the institution of these three measures. Some other good kind of epidemiologic, ecologic studies here. Um, uh, just yesterday, uh, the New York Times um, showed this study um, from Kansas, where Kansas had instituted a state uh, mandate for masks, but every county could choose what they wanted to do. So some of the counties said you can mask and some said, nope, we're not going to do that. It was political. And um, so counties could opt out of the mandate. And essentially, to put it uh, uh, simply, there was a 50% reduction in COVID transmission in the counties who adopted that mask mandate versus the counties in Texas who did not. A similar sort of um, study uh, was published in Health Affairs on June 16th. By this point, 15 states had mask mandates between April 8th and May 15th in the United States. And after those mask mandates, we saw declines in case numbers before and after the mandates controlling for other um, uh, uh, shelter-in-place guidelines and other uh, guidelines. Now, this is important because we don't have a federal mask mandate uh, in the United States, and um, conceivably we can't because of how our structure and system works, but that could be changed, as Dr. Fauci said on the weekend, um, and we'll talk about that. But I do want to say that um, mask mandates have, 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 in the United States, been shown to be very effective. So this is not a confused messaging in the United States, actually. Despite us saying it's confused, it's not confused um, from our major public health bodies. Uh, the CDC, has, since April 3rd, has been very consistent in its, in its messaging about universal public masking. Um, Dr. Redfield said to the Senate on September 16th, these face masks are the most important, powerful public health tool we have. I might even go so far as to say that this face mask is more guaranteed to protect me against COVID and when I take a COVID-19 vaccine, he got a call afterwards from the president um, who said, you must have misunderstood the question, but it's very important to, to hear the strong statements that he's made around masking. Um, the NAID director, Dr. Fauci, has also been very consistent with his messaging. He said at CNN on Friday, actually, well, if people are not wearing masks, then maybe we should be mandating it. And that paves the way for this question about a national mask mandate um, under a new administration. Uh, our current administration has not messaged um, well about wearing masks and in fact have mocked um, the concept and unfortunately that has led to uneven rates of mask wearing in, in the United States. So let's go on to the next possible reason for why you'd want to wear a mask and um, this is really the viral inoculum theory. Could it reduce the severity of illness if you are exposed and do get infected? So um, this would be great if masks combated COVID-19 in two ways, because actually we as public health practitioners would want two things to happen with COVID-19. We would want to bring down transmission rates, but we certainly are interested in bringing down the severity of illness and bringing down morbidity of this infection, because it can be very morbid and can lead to death. And um, the question is, 
can you have one measure that does both? That's what the vaccine trials are looking at. Vaccine trials have um, as their primary outcome decreasing transmission. And many of the, most of the vaccine trials have as their secondary outcome decreasing severity of disease. So could masks be um, influencing both of these strategies? Well, we have to start with the idea of, okay, well, what's the rate of asymptomatic COVID-19 infection now before we say that we wanna actually drive up those rates? What is the current rate of asymptomatic infection? And this is a strange virus. It is not normal um, for a virus to cause uh, so many people to have zero symptoms and then some to have mild symptoms and then some to be very, very, very ill. Um, and so it is this concept of these protean clinical manifestations that SARS-CoV-2 causes that has been so strange about this virus. Um, and what is the current rate of asymptomatic infection? Well, you really need studies where you not only mass test a population, like the Unidos and Salute campaign did here in um, April in the Mission District with um, uh, Diane Halbrook, Gabe Jamie, and, and Karina Marquez, but you also want to follow the participants out for two weeks to make sure that they don't become symptomatic because it's a difference when you qualify someone as pre-symptomatic, they're going to develop symptoms versus asymptomatic. And not only did Unidos and Salud did, did this, but there have been some good studies that have really followed patients out for those two weeks after mass testing. And the CDC said on July 10th that the current rate of asymptomatic infection with this virus is 40%. So are there settings, the question that I'll ask you later when we get to the outbreak setting is, have we seen settings where that rate is higher? And what is that magic factor where that rate is so high with asymptomatic infection? And a question that I pose is, can we move the needle on decreasing disease severity? Um, the, I will go over this more later, but this is a figure from the CDC here that shows um, essentially um, death rates from pneumonia-like illnesses. And you can see that we had, um, you know, every winter we have uh, uh, peaks, um, but nothing like this year, and that's all COVID-19. And of course, COVID-19 caused very severe mortality during March and April in the United States. But in July and August, the mortality was down. And what can we do to move the needle on decreasing mortality? So let's talk about uh, why I think um, masks could be moving that needle. Um, masks do reduce the viral inoculum to which the wearer is exposed. An N95 mask will reduce, you will actually filter out about 95% of virus. And depending on the mask, and we'll go into this later when we get into some physical science data, um, surgical masks and uh, cloth masks can block up to about 85% of viral particles. And we'll get into the aerosol droplets and some physical science data later. So then the question that I pose here in the next part of this talk is, is there evidence from virologic, epidemiologic, and ecologic studies that reducing that viral inoculum that you get in, that dose, and I really wanna use the word inoculum or dose and not load, because load refers to what um, the, the patient produces. So let's call it inoculum or dose. Is there evidence um, from uh, different lines of data that this reduces the severity of disease? I will say we do not have experimental data for this in humans because that would be vastly unethical to give humans a little bit of SARS-CoV-2 and a lot of SARS-CoV-2 and see if they get less or more sick. So what's the virologic evidence of this theory? Well, actually there's quite a bit of data in the animal literature that viral inoculum or size matters. Essentially, um, there's data dating back to 1938. This is one of the oldest studies. Um, this is published in American Journal of Hygiene. It was actually called the Reed and Munch hypothesis based on the two authors. Um, and you can see, I love this, that they probably drew that figure because that's how 1938 uh, was. But um, essentially that this defined what was called the LD50 of a virus or the lethal dose 50, which was the dose of a virus at which 50% of animals have the most severe uh, manifestation you could think of, which is death. So the lethal dose uh, 50 of a virus. There have been at many, many animal studies that have shown the relationship between inoculum with animal viruses and disease severity. And have we seen this with SARS-CoV-2? Have there been animal models that have shown us this? Well, yes, there has. There's been both a hamster model and a ferret model. This is the um, picture from the hamster, Syrian hamster model. This was published in 
PNAS. And the more, the higher the dose that was given to these hamsters, the more sick they became. And you can see their little CT scan, sadly. Um, but they're very high, uh, they had very bad looking CT scans if they had the higher dose, which is the uh, in shown in red, as opposed to the lower dose, which is shown in blue. And then there was a recent ferret study um, that showed the same dose response relationship. And have we seen in the animal model any impact about masking? Well, yes, in another Syrian hamster study, um, this was uh, from University of Hong Kong uh, and published in CID, you can see that these hamsters were actually masked. And now they weren't given these tiny little baby masks that you can see in that picture, though that is truly one of my favorite pictures to come out of this awful pandemic. Um, but it is um, that they were put into cages and they had surgical mask partitions. Um, so it was simulated masking. And the hamsters that were simulated masking versus not, and then they piped in the SARS-CoV-2 from exposure, the ones that were masked were not only less likely to get COVID, um, but they had more mild disease. So that was also along the line of masked hamsters getting more mild disease if exposed. Now, we haven't had human experiments with SARS-CoV-2. We can't, even though the challenge vaccine trials that are being proposed in the UK may give us something around this if they use low enough doses because they have to. But we have seen this with other viruses. Other viruses have been given to human volunteers at little doses and higher doses. And we have seen that relationship between viral inoculum and disease severity. These are three um, studies, two in CID and one in the Virology Journal of giving influenza A to human volunteers. And you give them a little bit and they get a little bit sick and you give them more and they have more fever and cough. So that relationship has been shown with influenza in humans. So that is essentially the virologic evidence around inoculum and disease severity. What about epidemiologic evidence with um, masking and what comes out in terms of disease severity with SARS-CoV-2? Well, I'll fir first start with a historical example. Um, this is a study that was published in PLOS-1 in 2010, and it was called the Influenza Infectious Dose, Dose May Explain the High Mortality of the Second and Third Wave of the 1918-1919 Influenza Pandemic. Because as you can see on the figure on the right, the first mortality wave of uh, the 1918 influenza pandemic was actually less deadly than the second wave, which you can see here uh, showed more higher mortality which is unusual for a pandemic. Usually the second wave does lead to lower mortality for a variety of reasons, um, including uh, immunity. But in this case, there was higher mortality. And what the authors attempted to do in this article was to say that that was the time when we were overcrowding. That was the time when uh, soldiers in World War I in the United States were overcrowding, when we were overcrowding here at home uh, because of uh, various conditions of the war. And so, their postulate is that exposure to the higher infectious dose in the May 1918 wave led to higher mortality. This is, there's also a paper that I reference here on the right on overcrowding and intensive exposure as determinants of measles mortality. Uh, this has also been seen among households uh, with measles. This was a 1984 article that being exposed to more overcrowding and higher uh, exposure would lead to higher measles mortality in the home. And then this, in a way, this is reminiscent of what happened with this first wave of SARS-CoV-2. At the very beginning, before um, there was masking recommendations, there was exposure to higher doses. Uh, there was exposure among healthcare workers before universal uh, masking and healthcare workers got very sick and there were many healthcare wor workers deaths. Uh, in Italy and New York, um, there were many deaths at the beginning. Um, before all of these barrier precautions were in play. And then household contacts were more, not only more likely to get SARS-CoV-2 transmission, but more likely to get sick. Um, have we seen this with SARS-CoV-2? Well, this is a nice study that was um, published in CID from Switzerland. This showed three companies of Swiss soldiers. And essentially what happened is company number one um, <clears throat> was instituted where well, let me actually first talk about company two and three. This was in an outbreak in COVID at the beginning of the pandemic in Switzerland where they didn't even know what was going on. They didn't recommend masking or social distancing. And in companies two and three, there were a lot of cases, 62% cases in an outbreak, and there was 30% illness. In company one, by that time they knew, 
and they said either stay away from each other, social distance, or mask. They didn't actually do both. They either social distance, or if you couldn't social distance, they wore a surgical mask if they were within six feet. And there was 0% illness in that company. Um, so not only were there fewer cases, but there was just 0% illness compared to 30% illness. And there was the same you know, age group. These were young uh, men. So um, the uh, authors of this concluded that the viral inoculum seemed to have an effect on clinical manifestations as well as a transmission. And then um, here are some other conditions where we've seen um, some settings where we've seen the rate of asymptomatic infection deviate substantially from that 40% under masked conditions. For example, cruise ships are a nice sort of uh, closed setting because no one ever lets people off a cruise ship when there's an outbreak. So, um, so the Diamond Princess, that happened, and as you know, they were in the harbor for a long time. But um, at that point, there was about, uh, uh, at one study showed 18% asymptomatic infection and 40% in another with more testing. Um, so that was equivalent to the CDC estimate of 40% infection. However, there was another cruise ship in Argentina that there was an outbreak on board. And at this point, there were masking. Uh, um, they, I don't know if they threw masks overboard, but they gave them all masks. And they gave all the passengers surgical masks. They gave all the staff N95 masks. And the rate of asymptomatic infection in that outbreak was 80%. Then if we look at the meat processing plants here in the United States, there was a lot of illness at the beginning. It actually led to a debate with the administration um, saying, well, meat processing plants, we have to keep open. We need our meat. Um, so um, they weren't closed, but what the meat processing plants did is that they put safety measures into play. And so there were two uh, large outbreaks, one in Tyson uh, chicken plant in Arkansas and one in an Oregon seafood processing plant, but there was masking, meaning, um, not only did their mask mandates of their workers, they actually handed people masks at the door like we do in our healthcare center when we, um, when we enter Ward 86, for example. And, um, and the rate, there was a big outbreak, there were 500 people infected, but 95% of them were asymptomatic. And then there was a pediatric hemodialysis unit, this was published in JAMA, where there was a lot of, um, uh, uh, there was a um, pediatric child who, uh, child who came in and he had COVID, but everyone was masked and there was a lot of seroconversion, but they were all asymptomatic. So these are the suggestive kind of epidemiologic data that in outbreaks where people are masking, the rate of asymptomatic infection is much higher than that 40%. And then among healthcare workers, this is a study on the left um, that was published by the CDC MMWR that showed that healthcare workers, frankly, uh, across 13 academic medical centers have had a lot more exposure than we think, um, but that is likely uh, because we've been universally masking. We didn't know because uh, there's been a lot of asymptomatic infection. Luckily that universal masking should prevent forward transmission, but it's important to say that um, likely the universal masking has led to a lot more asymptomatic infection. And then this study on the right got a lot of attention. This was a case control study from the CDC showing what are the activities that are most associated with importantly see in the title symptomatic COVID-19. And um, being in um, a fitness center or religious ceremony or places that you could mask was not associated with symptomatic disease, but being in a place where you had to take off that mask was associated with asymptomatic uh, symptomatic disease, and that was bars and restaurants. Um, and that was published on September 11th. And then finally, let's go into the ecologic evidence. This is, of course, the weakest lines of evidence because this is big country level data. There's a lot going on in different countries, but certainly we have to pay attention to masking compliance um, and masking guidelines in other countries. I think we haven't been paying enough attention that um, in countries that have masked consistently, uh, and that would mean um, countries that were used to masking because of the SARS pandemic, uh, Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Thailand, South Korea, Singapore, Vietnam, these countries have had very low rates of hospitalizations and deaths. The uh, mortality of this illness has been very low. And in fact, as you can see on this picture on the right from a Tokyo street just a couple of days ago, it's not like the country isn't open. Uh, the countries have, uh, Japan, Tokyo has been open. Um, not large crowds, um, that there's a lot of people on transportation going to the offices, going to schools, and their cases have gone up but not deaths, low hospitalizations, low severity. 
And there was a very interesting study that was in Med Archives from Tokyo um, that was just a few days ago posted. But Tokyo had a seroprevalence increase between May and August. And you can see all these people on the street together. So people are maybe getting um, exposed, um, but there was a lot of asymptomatic infection and a lot of um, infection that resolved and no one even knew the difference. What I mean is the seroprevalence increase went from 5.8% in May to 46.8% of having been exposed to COVID over the course of the summer, um, all asymptomatic. And so I don't know what explains that, except that I do have to say that I have talked to many people in Japan and asked them what the compliance rate is, and the number is invariably 100%. Um, so haven't had an issue with the uh, uneven rates of masking failure of leadership um, that we've seen in this country. Uh, and then I want to mention the Czech Republic because I think it's a very interesting scenario where um, it actually, earlier than any other country um, in Europe and certainly the United States, uh, mandated masking, mandated universal facial masking on March 23rd. Actually, the health official from Czechoslovakia was on a plane coming back like at the beginning of March and he's like, uh-oh, I have to do something. Um, and, he, and he mandated this. And um, so March 23rd, everyone started wearing facial masks and they've had very, very low rates of deaths in cases. Then on May 11th, they said, we're done, we're, we're doing great. You can stop wearing your masks. And um, slowly but surely the cases and deaths went up. So they are not yet for some, they're contemplating a universal mask mandate again. Um, and then this is some, um, uh, this is analysis that we did, uh, uh, but this is looking at the effects of uh, mask mandates across 1,083 counties in the United States and, um, and the effects on hospitalizations. Um, and we see decreases in hospitalizations after mask mandates in uh, these counties as represented on the right. And importantly, it's controlling for other things like case per population, case rate per 100,000 people, testing rates, population mobility by cell phone data, and age of the population. So um, we need to do more analyses on this, to be frank, um, in different places. Like I just contacted the Kansas people this morning and said, can you look at hospitalizations in those counties um, that masked and the counties that didn't? And they said so they'd look into it. But I think it's important to make those comparisons about severity of disease as well as um, uh, uh, cases to help build a case. And then um, there was a model published by IHME that got a lot of attention in the press a couple of days ago, but this model actually a couple of months ago had shown the same thing, which is essentially what will happen um, with death rates if you uh, do universal masking. So this model was quite prescient early on, it was published in um, April, but uh, that if you could stop lockdown, but do no masks, the model predicted that you would have continued deaths. But if you had 50% mask compliance, even 50%, the um, death rates would go down significantly. And then if you have 80% compliance, death rates would be flat. And I think if there's any place that we can say death rates have been very low, it is San Francisco. And I think, um, I think I can venture to say that our compliance rate here is 80%. Um, so that's an interesting sort of ecologic bit of evidence. Lockdown is a very blunt instrument. Um, I, I think it's extremely uh, destructive to the poor. Um, on the other hand, masking, which is uh, uh, better and easier to do, um, actually takes behavior change. So um, it's conflicting principles of change. Um, and then this is data from the Washington Post um, from just the other day. And, um, and this is just an analysis that they did actually using the IHME data um, that on October 23rd, that um, in places that have the highest right rates of mask use, they're the fewest COVID-19 symptoms reported. So it could be because there's no, there are fewer cases. It could be that um, that symptoms, this could be suggestive of Ill, uh, degree of illness. Um, so we don't know, it's hard to tease that out. Um, but it's it's interesting that South Dakota's up here, um, you know, with its with its low prevalence of mask use and its high percentage of people who know someone with COVID nineteen. So, what would be before we go on to mortality? What would be this mechanism of why 
the higher vir viral inocula would be related to more severe disease. Because we've been combing the literature, we have a fellow looking at this, um, trying to put a, put a review paper together on, uh, this is Chip Chambers' uh, name, not mine, but size matters. Um, but it's not, it's important to say, this is not seen for all viruses. So as I pointed out, um, there's some data that this has been seen with influenza, both in experimental data and um, that ecologic data from the PLAS1 article that I shared about the, um, about the 1918 pandemic. This has been observed with measles, or at least has been implicated with measles with the overcrowding being associated with more measles mortality. And there's some data on this in dengue, um, looking back at some of the earlier descriptions of dengue. Um, but, but it's not true of all viruses. So what would be that possible mechanism? And um, I think it has to do with, I think it has to do with the immune system. I think it has to do with when the immune system has a big role to play in viral pathogenesis or so-called immunopathology. And certainly we know SARS-CoV-2 um, has that happen because at the beginning, um, it's really the innate immune response being dysregulated and out of control that can lead to all these release of cytokines and other immune mediators that can lead to severe illness. It's in fact, um, one of the reasons why uh, dexamethasone or steroids is the only uh, treatment to date for SARS-CoV-2 that consistently has shown a decrease in mortality. So could it be that getting, getting in that higher viral inoculum leads to a more dysregulated and overwhelmed innate immune response and that increases the severity of illness and getting in a lower inoculum may, may, uh, may allow the innate immune system to do its proper job and the adaptive immune system to come into play. So um, I don't know, but this is what uh, we've been wondering about um, in terms of the possible mechanism is that this is truly a disease where immunopathology plays a role. Um, I meant to actually put this at the end, uh, and I'm sorry that it came here, but I'll just mention it because I know it's going to be a question, and I think it's a very good question that should be asked, is what masks are, should we use? And I will say that I think, I think the number of physical sciences papers and engineering papers has been confusing. I think it's hard. I think they're a variable quality. And um, I wouldn't recommend you deciding on a mask just by looking at that literature alone. I think you have to look at literature from the past as well. So uh, what, I mean to, what I mean by that is there's this sort of traditional idea that N95 masks will block aerosols and, um, and nothing else will block aerosols. And now we're sort of seeing in with this particular SARS-CoV-2 that it's kind of a mix between droplet and aerosols and it depends on the conditions. It depends on ventilation and how hard you're speaking and um, if you're singing and it, 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 de and it depends on many, many things. But let's just say, to put it very simply, it's a mixture of droplets and aerosols. So sometimes it comes with big globs of spit and sometimes it's sort of on its own, to put it simply. And um, do surgical masks block aerosols? And the traditional idea had been, nope, we you need an N95 to block your aerosols. And, you know, that isn't strictly true. This is a 2012 study. We just haven't done good studies. So this is a 2012 study where TB patients, and this is as good as it gets in terms of gold standard, right, where you have guinea pigs involved in TB. But um, this was a study where TB patients were in a room, guinea pigs were in the next room, and their air was being piped out to the guinea pigs. And when the patients wore masks, um, uh, the guinea pigs got sick, um, didn't get sick, or, or at least their transmission rate to the guinea pigs was reduced 50% of the time. And when they didn't wear masks, the um, transmission rate was high to the guinea pigs. So what that indicates is if you're gonna say any classic um, infectious disease that's an aerosol, -led, uh, aerosol um, disease is TB, that even in TB, surgical masks have shown utility. And then there have been a lot of environmental studies and I really feel like it's just a little too much and we need um, better control over this. But, um, but this is a good study from Japan that I like um, that was just published that did look at the effectiveness of face masks with aerosols and droplets and saw um, um, good blocking with um, both droplets and aerosols. And then a, um, I actually emailed um, a really great expert, Lindsay Marr in, in uh, Virginia this morning. But I think the study that's been most intriguing 
that she mentioned is um, that there was a study done by Canadians that actually looked at um, what would it take for a cloth mask to block the most. And to put it really simply, just like you need high thread count for um, your sheets, you need high thread count for your cotton mask. So it is really two layers. So you need your two ply cotton mask and you want high thread count, like 600. Um, why? Because that's blocking more. It just totally makes sense. Thread count means that there's more to block. So two ply high thread count is what I'm gonna start using and recommending for my patients. Okay, so let's go to immunity and go to the most controversial aspect of um, this paper that I wrote with George Rutherford because got some flack for it, but I'm going to push through anyway and talk to you about immunity. Um, so um, remember, I think one thing that we have to say, um, and I think we'll have plenty of time for questions, is that, um, that when the public talks about seroprevalence studies or when um, the press talks about seroprevalence studies, that is one arm of the immune system is antibodies, right? So to put it super simply, right, we have the T cell arm and we have the B cell arm and B cells produce antibodies through plasma cells. And it's the T cell arm that of course is divided into CD4s and CD8s. And it is that arm of the immune system that we think about for more enduring immunity to viruses. Um, and uh, it, depending on the virus, um, you can have quite enduring immunity. You can get chickenpox once and have immunity for the rest of your life. Maybe not, but often. Um, that's a DNA virus that may not uh, hold true for the RNA viruses and measles takes a lot of extra doses um, and uh, booster doses throughout your life, which is an RNA virus and coronaviruses. We can say the coronaviruses don't have durable T cell immunity, but I cannot extrapolate for this coronavirus from other coronaviruses because you can't extrapolate the clinical symptoms from SARS and MERS. This is a totally different virus. So I'm gonna wait and see about the durability of immunity with T cell. There have been very hopeful studies, at least in the short term though, that strong T cell and B cell immunity develops, even with asymptomatic or mild infection over the past, uh, and these studies have come out over the last past, past six weeks. I referenced them all here. They're from Sweden and Denmark and UCSF and UW and um, Japan and these studies have essentially shown that even with mild or asymptomatic infection, strong T cell responses can develop. I don't know how long those are going to last, but I don't actually think any of us do. I think the most hopeful question about um, how long our immunity will last is the fact that whether we want to admit this or not, this epidemic has now been going on close to a year. Um, horrifying the thing, and it is, um, and it is um, uh, 43 million cases and counting, and we've seen very few documented reinfections. We have five documented reinfections. They're from Hong Kong, Nevada, Seattle, Ecuador, and Belgium. Two of them are in, three of them are in preprint, two of them are in publication form. There is a nice uh, review of them um, in publication form for the Lancet uh, ID one, but essentially, um, it, it may mean that you know a lot of people are getting infected again and we don't know it that's very very possible but if we don't know it they're likely asymptomatic and that is the role of immunity right like if you get reinfected and you get asymptomatic illness thank goodness that's a good thing about immunity but um we've only had five documented cases of reinfection and i think that's rare some people will say that's a lot i think that's rare with 43 million people and counting so, um, so what we proposed in this article um, was this question of could facial masking be serving as a form of variolation? So remember that variolation was the process before we had vaccines um, by which um, variola virus was, a little cut was made in the skin and the scab from a patient with smallpox or a piece of pus or a piece of hair um, was put in that scab, uh, was put in that cut. And the hope is that you generate a mild asymptomatic infection and you generate immunity. Um, we have vaccine uh, uh, now, we have vaccines now, and of course we've eradicated smallpox, but we don't have a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. And this is what, um, when people get mad at me for saying this, I keep on saying, but we don't have a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2 yet. We will, that's the most important thing to get. We need to get to a safe and effective vaccine. We need to distribute it equitably but we don't have a vaccine. And so right now, if facial masking leads to more asymptomatic and mild infection, and you get a mild infection, 
and then you get immunity, at least some immunity, and we don't know how long it'll last, couldn't that be a good thing for increasing population level immunity? And that's what would be argued in, this, in, the, um, in the data that I just presented to you from Tokyo, um, where uh, very few severe illnesses and deaths and uh, clearly a lot of antibody prevalence in Tokyo. So this leads me to my final point, which are six possible reasons for decreases in mortality with COVID-19. And I actually think there are six, and I'd love to hear um, ideas on more. But I showed you this graph before that the second wave, um, or if you call it the continuation of the first wave, and now we're in our even more continuation of our um, first wave or the third wave. But essentially, if you look at that second wave in July and August, there was lower mortality from COVID-19. And I think that there are six possible reasons. I think people at younger ages getting infected is one. I think that we have done a better job in this country um, at better infection control mass testing in nursing homes. Uh, we, we wiped out a lot of the vulnerable at the beginning. That is not a good way to get to uh, lower mortality. Um, is it more testing of asymptomatics? That would only lead to a lower case fatality rate. This is just representing absolute deaths in um, um, from uh, respiratory diseases. Um, is it population-wide masking? I hope I've convinced you that it could be a factor. Um, population level immunity, that could be a factor as well if it leads to more asymptomatic infections that are never detected. And then I do think, of course, that we have better treatments. We at least have two that are approved um, and, um, and, uh, and better hospital preparedness. So, um, it's certainly true, uh, and this is well known at this point, that um, younger age is associated with uh, doing better from this infection. This is data from the CDC, but really um, yeah, the, the rate of death is much higher um, as you get older. And um, so could it be that uh, there are people just being infected at younger ages as society has opened up? Well, that is true. The WHO on August 18th did warn that young people are the main spreaders of coronavirus worldwide. Uh, including in this country. Um, however, this is interesting data from uh, Germany from, and, and actually this was shown in a couple of European countries. This was actually um, evidence gathered by Oxford, the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine, that the case fatality rate, at least um, in Germany and the UK um, and Spain and Italy between the first and the second wave um, fell in all age groups. So that would sort of belie that it's all about age. It fell in the 60 to 79 year olds and the uh, greater than 80 year olds. So um, that would kind of go against the younger age being the only factor. Could we be reaching some level of population level immunity, whether it was wittingly um, as in Sweden or whether it was unwittingly as in New York or Italy? Um, I don't know, but I think some herd immunity could be happening. And um, I think that data from Japan that I uh, told you about is very interesting about what could be going on in Tokyo. Because again, open, open city, but with masking. And then certainly we have some treatments now. We actually only have two. So um, when we say we have treatments, we only have two, but it's important and delightful and wonderful that we have some. And dexamethasone has been most consistently uh, shown in severe disease to be associated, uh, associated with decreased mortality. Remdesivir, the data has been more mixed. Um, but it is approved by the FDA the other day, and we certainly use this in patients with um, ranging from moderate to severe disease, a specific antiviral. And then this is where I meant to tell you about the physical sciences, but I already did. And then I want to end with a, with a statement that I um, have been very profoundly disturbed as an HIV doctor um, and a longstanding harm reductionist and a longstanding uh, person who thinks about public health messaging in a different way about how we have been yelling at each other in this country. I'm profoundly disturbed by anything that says wear an F mask that is inappropriate, maybe just wear a mask. Um, I also think calling people stupid um, who don't mask, I think our messaging has been confusing here. I think the public health messaging has been confusing. I think the president's been confusing. And I think we have to learn how to message differently. Um, because that's how behavior change can be accomplished. And so I think we have to come back to our HIV roots um, for many of us and think about how to message differently. And I will end there and take questions. Um, this is the summary, facial masking, I think reduces transmission, may reduce severity of disease, may increase population level immunity. I think it's a very strong pillar of pandemic control. Um, and I think that we need to message kindly. So I, I'm very happy to take any of your questions. 
Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Monica. Can you stop yes. sharing the screen, please? Yes. Um, there are many questions already coming in the Q&A, and uh, Kemi Amin will kindly help us uh, moderate those questions. Um, let me throw one for you, Monica, before Kemi gets started. Um, are you aware of um, any serological studies among uh, UCSF health workers, similar to what UCLA did, comparing um, serology between um, that study health workers is, and the community? That study is ongoing. It's called the CHART study and was funded by the Chan's, uh, Chan Zuckerberg Foundation. So that study is ongoing. I have to say we have had I mean, as touted in the LA Times the other day, I mean, we have just had very few deaths in the city of San Francisco and um, have been very good about controlling our case, cases, except over that shorter period over the summer. So um, I think New York or LA may be more interesting places to do that. We're also very good about universal masking in our healthcare system. I, I just go there every day and I know I see the compliance. We won't even eat each, around each other. Um, but but we'll see what that shows. Okay, thank you. Kimmy. All right, great. Thanks, Jaime. And thank you so much, Monica, for a great presentation. Uh, we have a few questions, so I'm just going to jump in. Uh, our first question is, is it possible that mortality is down in the second wave because hospitals and staff are better equipped to handle the cases? Yes, I gave that as um, uh, reason number six, and I think that's right, that um, when there's any hospital where you are overflowing, where, I mean, I'm just going to say it, it was clearly New York City at the beginning, um, where nurses are not staffed to patients appropriately, where people are doing each other's jobs, that is where mortality can happen. So absolutely, we are better prepared in our hospitals, and, um, and uh, I absolutely give that as reason number one of the most important, one important reason. Great. Next question, is the hypothesis that an asymptomatic individual would emit lower dose disease that would make it more likely that a newly infected contact would get less severe or even asymptomatic uh, disease? I think this is a really important question and we don't know. So I think that it's a little bit between this, this question of viral inoculum versus viral load, and they're actually different. So viral inoculum is the amount you get in, then you have a response that you have, and then you start putting out virus if you're infected from your nose and mouth. And that I'm calling the viral load. And the viral load can be quite high among people who are asymptomatic. In fact, it was so high among people who are asymptomatic at the beginning that we were like, it's equal and um, you can, we better mask up, which is what important reason for masking. But more recent data has shown that the viral load that you emit actually may be related to your severity of illness. And so meaning you have a higher viral load if you're more sick, which actually in a way makes sense with the viral inoculum. I think they're actually part and parcel of the same thing because you get a high, lower, a higher viral inoculum. You can't control it that well. Your adaptive immune system is trying to control it. And then you put out a higher viral load, you're more sick. It's possible, this is more recent data from, for example, Wayne State University and other settings. So if that's true, the more sick you are, the higher viral load you give, then it's true that someone who's asymptomatic may be putting out a lower viral load and may make someone less sick. Um, so I think the data is swinging more towards the latter direction with our later studies, but I think we need bigger studies that compare the viral loads between asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals, but it's swinging towards the direction that you just said. Got it. And just to follow up on that, the, the Ad Council has endorsed um, ads that are going out right now about um, when you wear a mask, you're protecting others. When others wear a mask, they're protecting you. When you wear a mask, is there any evidence that shows it goes both ways, like the filtering process? Yes. So this data that I told you about, and again, we have to separate physical sciences from epidemiologic data. So the epidemiologic data is showing that just in general, everything's going down when people mask. So that it's kind of like um, prep, right? Like when you bring down rates in the community, it's a good thing and it protects everyone. Um, however, the physical sciences data, yes, there has been data that shows that wearing a mask protects you. And the best study is the one that I referenced yesterday. And I'll get you the reference as soon as I can. I think they're putting it together. Um, and they're going to be televising this data. But 
essentially it's two ply. And by the way, someone asked, I see later about three ply. No, three ply is not better. It's in fact worse because people take off their three ply mask because no one can hear each other. And so they actually lift it up and start talking. So you want two ply and that's what this uh, physical sciences study showed. Um, but you want two ply with high thread count. So you want that slippery feel like of your sheets against your mouth and it's very comfortable. It's very easy to wear. And um, I think we're going to start putting standard into places instead of just ordering it off Amazon. Um, but, um, but it is two ply and, um, and they have to be strong thread count. And that's what the physical science data is showing us. Got it. <clears throat> Next question. Um, in the studies showing that masking increases asymptomatic infection, is age controlled? So um, not always, but in the two um, healthcare, in the two studies that showed from, um, from the cruise ships, yes, like they were the same age match, age match groups, essentially. Who takes cruises? Older patients. Um, so yes, they, they were basically the same age range. What is the efficacy of masks in uh, preventing COVID-19 transmissions in population, not health settings? What efficacy level was used in the IHME model? Is that the Institute uh, for Health and Metrics and Evaluation? Yes. So um, they did not um, rain, They did not give an efficacy level. This was models based on a certain percentage of the population masking. They assumed the masks that were recommended by the um, by the public by this public health agency in this country, which is the CDC. So what's recommended right now is cloth face coverings. There's not a specific one. There's not a specific efficacy level. And I think that your your questions are all sort of going to this. That it's a good point. That um, that I think we do need to get to better since we are going to be masking up for a while. We need to, need, do need to bring all this data together and to get to better masking standards. And so to Maria's question, because I'm going to answer this first because it's related to this, it's, an, it's the two-ply, it's high thread count, and filters are not necessary. So let's get to comfort and, um, and, dur and, and uh, wearing, wearing it all day long because that's how much we have to change our habits. Got it. Uh, do we know the ID50 of SARS-CoV-2? No, we don't because, and George, uh, are you mocking me because of Michael Osterholm? So um, no, we don't, that's, that's uh, we don't. Um, th there are some epidemiologists in the Midwest who have said that um, it's the same ID50 of SARS. They're completely different viruses. It's not 300 variants that infects someone. I have no idea. And, and I don't think any of us do what the ID50 is. So that's why we're gonna keep up these barrier methods until we um, get to a vaccine. Given the key role of the immune system response, what data are you seeing, if any, in uh, immunocompromised populations being infected with COVID-19? Not only those with viral infections like HIV, but those with multi or malfunctioning immune systems, such as Crohn's disease, where treatment involves suppression of parts of the immune system. Um, so it is, it's a very good question. We were worried um, at the beginning that HIV would be a factor implicated in more severe outcomes because that had been seen with influenza. However, we were also wondering if having an immunocompromising illness would also make you do better because the immune system is involved in the immunopathology of this disease, as you said. And I think that that's right. Essentially, HIV, to put a lot of data together, and I'm giving a talk on this tomorrow, doesn't seem to be associated with more severe outcomes, unless you're overwhelmed like in New York City at the beginning. It just a lot of data together. It doesn't seem to be associated with more severe outcomes with COVID-19. So that argues that the immune system being a little down in some cases could help you. Um, in terms of the biologics and steroids and whatnot, the data is actually quite conflicting. There was data from, um, uh, from ID week last week that looked at a, and, and from the HIV Glasgow meeting on October 4th through 8th, that looked at a number of people who were immunocompromised in different ways in Chicago, and there was no associated between immunocompromised and having more severe outcomes. So just we're in the middle of this pandemic. We need more data, but there hasn't been convincing data that uh, we, we do we do beware. I mean, we are aware of people on steroids when we think about it. Um, chemotherapy, one study said yes, one study said no. So we're not great in terms of where we are in coming down hard with this. I, I actually want to, uh, uh, sorry, I know we only have a few minutes. I heard immunity is not a myth. Um, it happens. It's just that um, 
we don't want to allow um, this disease to go ripping through a population and killing a lot of people to get there. So I think that's what Dr. Rutherford may have meant about a myth. That's not the way to go, but we do want to protect people. Great, next question. Viruses can survive on cloth face masks. Could reuse of the face mask cause infection? So um, uh, that's a great question. No, there has been no evidence of that. It's kind of the same thing with like a virus sitting on a surface. You can actually culture it from a surface, but that doesn't mean that's how you get virus. And again, I've never known a time in history where this many physical scientists and engineers have gotten into the mix and are just culturing things from all over the place. But that said, um, the CDC recommendation is to wash your mask every day. Um, I actually don't have time to do that, so I wash it every other day. Um, and I don't use a surgical mask more than one day. And I think that's fair to say. So surgical masks are essentially used to be one-time use only. Now we're stretching it out to save it. We use it pretty much the whole day. And if it looks clean by the end of the day, I'll use it the next day. And then I will say I will do my uh, cloth masks because um, I have two children in my home and we, uh, we have the same, we use adjustable ones, we use the same ones. I wash them every two days in the sink and hang them over my banister. Great. Um, you're getting a lot of praise for your great presentation. Um, and uh, I think we have time for just a couple of more questions. Uh, could you please explain why you think there might be some level of herd immunity occurring? Oh, because uh, things like antibody testing showing 40, you know, 50% of the population being exposed in, um, in uh, Tokyo, um, things like um, this strong T cell immunity being developed with asymptomatic infection. I mean, immunity is immunity. We don't have to politicize it. Um, immunity exists to infectious diseases. The politicization has come around the question of should we allow this virus to rip through society like the Great Barrington De Declaration? That shouldn't be allowed because um, that will mean that many people could get sick. So um, anyone who thinks that you should do herd immunity and then doesn't want to do masks, that doesn't make sense to me. So I think you'd want a mask, but there are people who can't stay in their house all day. And that would be probably many people on this call who are going to the going to work every day and are working in healthcare workers settings and who are essential healthcare, health, essential workers and grocery store workers. And what you really want to think about is how to keep people safe. And I think we have very, very excellent at this point between masking, social distancing, ventilation, selective testing, contact tracing, and isolation quarantine, great ways to keep people safe. Great, thank you so much. I think that's all the time we have for now. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jaime. Thank you, thank you, Kemi. And uh, Monica, thank you so much again for an excellent uh, talk, uh, very persuasive evidence. And uh, I think you're becoming a real champion for making the case that masking does prevent infection, reduces severity of illness, and uh, so much more. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd be happy to answer these questions by text if you keep it on for a minute, because I have That's answers. Great. Okay, That's thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, a quick uh, reminder for people in the audience, uh, the applications for PhD, the deadline is December 1st. And for our master's program, applications are open now. So please spread a word. And also, I hope uh, you have voted already. If not, please do so as soon as possible because this is the most significant election we will face in our lifetimes. So go and vote. Thank you all and see you in the next COVID series. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.